Good morning again. If you'd open up your Bibles to Matthew, the sixth chapter this time, I'm going to begin with the words of Jesus once again. I'm going to use the Sermon on the Mount to uh, kind of provide the, the impetus for the thoughts here during uh, the Bible class hour this morning. Great once again to be with you all. Uh, I, again, I'd like to say a lot of uh, thank yous and howdy duties and introductory sort of stuff, but once again, I'm up against the clock and uh, I'm just not always great with that. So I'll have to save some of that for later. We are talking this week, though, for those maybe who are joining us for the first time right now, we are talking this week about what it means to be the people of God. As Peter would write to some Christians who were kind of scattered across the Roman Empire, who were having some difficulty experiencing maybe a little bit of alienation in their culture, he said to them in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, that you are, I want to remind you that you are a chosen race, you're a royal priesthood. Let's talk about that during the first session. You're a holy nation. You're a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light that once you were not a people, but now you are. You have a special designation. You are the people of God. What a, what a remarkable description of what it means to be a Christian. And in fact, even as you look at some of those descriptions there, I hope what really weighs on you is the fact that there's a lot of responsibility that comes along with that. We think and focus on all the blessings of being a Christian, but man, Peter wants to point out there is a heavy mantle of responsibility that we carry that we must live out our lives in a certain kind of way. And that began during the first session talking about that we're going to be people who use our influence for good. And this morning I want to talk about an aspect that I think really sets us apart from the world. We need to talk about something that makes us very unique. Let's begin that in Matthew chapter 6 with what Jesus says here, kind of, a, we refer to this oftentimes as the model prayer. I just want to notice the introduction of that prayer. In Hebrews 6, or excuse me, Matthew 6, verse 9, pray then like this, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Names matter, don't they? Names are important. When you were born, the very first gift that you were given by your mother and your father was your name. And if your parents were at all like Tiffany and I when it came to the selection of names for our two girls, then there's a pretty good chance that there was a lot of, a lot of forethought put into that, a lot of time, a lot of effort that went into making that important decision. Maybe your parents went out and bought a book of baby names. Maybe they asked around, hey, hey what was grandma's middle name? How, how exactly did she spell that? Maybe they went back and forth like my wife and I did for months and months and months arguing about that name until finally you agreed upon that name. And then maybe the day came that when the baby was delivered and was then presented to the world, then mama and daddy were able to say, this is the name of the child. All of that tells me that names matter. I've never met anybody who has a really peculiar or odd name, maybe a man who has the name of Mary. And you ask him, you say, wow, how did you get the name Mary? And he says, well, my, my parents just didn't care about names. They didn't. They told the delivery nurse, just, you know, hey, whatever comes to your mind, just write that on the birth certificate. And Mary's what she wrote down. I've never heard any story like that before. And why is that? Because names are important. And what Jesus says in Matthew 6 and verse 9, is that God's name is important. He says, hallowed be thy name. It is the supreme name. It is a name that is special and unique in all of the universe. And Jesus says that God's people are going to be people who revere that name. That we will be people who honor the name of God. That we treat it as holy because God's name matters. Yet the truth of the matter is, we are living in a culture, we're living in a time when that doesn't really seem to register very highly on people's priorities list. We live in a time when our culture just regularly throws around the phrase, oh my God this and oh my God that, treating it like it's just candy. And so maybe right now, here in the midst of the OMG culture, that maybe we are actually well past the time when we need to talk a little bit about the proper usage of God's name and what all is carried along with that? Why exactly should God's name be hallowed? What exactly does it mean to misuse God's name? What might be the consequences of irreverently using or disrespecting the name of God? 
Those are the kinds of questions I'd like for us to answer over the course of these next few minutes. And then I want to try to pack all that together at the end to make some very focused and direct application for you and I sitting in this room. I want all of us to be able to leave here today and to truly say with integrity in our hearts, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and that our words and our lives would match up to what it is that we say. And the place that I want to work on that from is not here in Matthew 6. It's actually in your Old Testament. Would you find Exodus chapter 20, please? In Exodus the 20th chapter, because it is right there in the middle of the Ten Commandments that we find God's most pointed legislation about the use of His name. What exactly did God say to Israel, those first covenant people, what did God say to them at Mount Sinai that we, God's covenant people today, what is it that we can still learn from today? I understand very clearly we're not bound by the Ten Commandments, but I also understand that Jesus incorporated nine of those ten into His covenant. And so what is it that we can learn from then that would be applicable for us today? Well, let's just read the commandment. In Exodus chapter 20, I'm reading in verse 7, there the Lord says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes His name in vain. There are three components to this command, and all of that just needs to begin with a little bit of understanding about the name of God. What exactly is the name of God? Somebody would say, well, duh, it's God. Okay, I understand that's the name that we probably most commonly use, but you also understand that that word God is actually kind of a generic word. It can be ascribed to all kinds of things. And in fact, you'll see usages in the Bible where it talks about things that are called gods or are given that name God, and they're not actually this God. If you hold your place here in Exodus 20, I can actually show you the proper name of God, if you will. Look at Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, you'll see the name of God as it was first revealed to Moses at the burning bush. In Exodus chapter 3, you remember that Moses is very concerned about the idea of going to see Pharaoh and and having to represent the children of Israel. And Moses says, "Ah, you know, I'm I'm not really sure about all this. Exodus chapter 3, look in verse 13. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel, and I say to them that the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? Well, what shall I say to them? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, you say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now that, that's a profound name, isn't it? That is an incredible name. In some ways, it's, it's a little bit awkward for us because that's not the kind of name that we're used to, the I am. And yet for Israel, that was a name that was full and rich with meaning. It meant I am the one who has always been and who always will be. And that name, the I am, it was written in four Hebrew characters that correspond to our English letters, and that's from right to left, the Y-H-W-H. And it is from that where we get the name of God, at least the best way that we know to pronounce that, Yahweh. Or maybe you might be familiar with kind of the anglicized version of that name. We see it a lot in many of our hymns, Jehovah. And that is a name that speaks of God's self-existence, His self sufficiency, His supreme sovereignty and control over everything. The Israelites learned that name of God and it meant that the sovereign ruler and creator of all, the always one, was with them and that He was their God. What we need to see from that then is that God's name is actually synonymous with Him. It is synonymous with His identity with His character and with His nature. That's really what we're talking about when we talk about the name of God. A lot of times people get really persnickety about the the, the letters and the characters and the arrangement of those letters. It's not really about the letters themselves. It's about what those letters represent. You know, when we say about somebody, hey, he's got a bad name around town. Well, what do we mean by that? He's got a bad name around town. Do we mean, oh, that guy, his name, the way you pronounce his name. Heath Rogers. The arrangement of the letters in that name. Oh man, that is a bad name. Is that what we mean by that? No, what we mean by that is he's a bad person. 
He does bad things. That's what's meant by that expression. And we understand that the name represents the person. And that's exactly what's going on when we talk about the name of God. The name stands for who He is. In fact, look with me in Exodus 34. Because quite regularly in Scripture, God associates His name with who He is and what He stands for and what He's all about. In Exodus chapter 34, this is to me one of the most just significant disclosures of God in all of Scripture. I would have, I mean, there's, I would give top dollar to have been Moses here. In Exodus chapter 34, look at what's said in verse 5. Exodus 34 verse 5. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Him there. And He proclaimed the name of the Lord. God is proclaiming His name. Well, what does that sound like? Verse 6. The Lord passed before Him and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and to the fourth generation. Do you see verse 5? How proclaiming the name of God meant verses 6 and 7, proclaiming the the character of God, the the nature of God, the very person and essence of who God is. The name stands for the person. I'll say once again, it's not about how we arrange those letters and, and oh man, if we don't get that right, then somehow we're messing it up. No, it's about what it represents. And I need us to think about just how significant that is. First and foremost, you realize that God, by giving His name, He takes a risk, doesn't He? God takes a huge risk by disclosing His name to human beings. You know, anytime somebody comes to you and asks you, hey, what's your name? There's a risk there, isn't there? Ladies, if some strange man comes up to you in the shopping mall and says, hey, what's your name? Ladies? How quick are you going to be to just volunteer that information to that guy? Probably thinking, whoa, get away from me. I don't know who you are or what you want. If you get a call on your cell phone and the caller ID doesn't actually show up a name or a number and it looks kind of odd and the voice on the other end says, hey, who am I speaking with? Again, how quick are you to just volunteer that information? I know that I'm not quick to do that. I don't know who that person is. I don't know what they want to do with my name. Maybe they're going to steal my identity or you know, rob my bank account or do something. We understand there's a risk with giving out your name. Anytime you give your name, it runs the risk of being misused or being abused. And so it is with God. When God revealed His name to humanity, He ran the risk of human beings exploiting that name or profaning that name, which might beg the question on our part, well, well why did God even give us His name then? If he knew people might mess it up, why did he give his name? And the answer to that really is quite simple. God gave us his name because he wants us to know him. He wants us to know him. Have you ever thought about how different our relationship with the Lord would be if he didn't tell us who he is? You know, we're down here on earth and we're kind of shouting up to the heavens, God, we we know you're there and, and, and we'd like to know your name. Well, we'd like to know who you are. Well, we'd like to be in a, in a relationship with you. We'd like to be able to, to speak of your name. We'd like to be able to tell others of your name. Well, we'd like to be able to, to praise your wonderful name. And God looks down from heaven and says, mm, Nah, I'm good. Not going to give you that information. Our, our relationship with God would be vastly different, wouldn't it? Many of you already know this, but... I've always found it ironic that in Bible times, very discerning Jews, they would not even write the name of God. Whenever scribes were copying down pages of the Old Testament, they would not even write the proper name of God. Instead, they would write the word that means our English term, Lord. You'll notice that in your Bibles if you see L-O-R-D in all capital letters. That's, That's the reader's cue that this is the name of God you're approaching. And the idea was that maybe if, if the Scriptures were being read, maybe in a, in a temple service or in the synagogue service, that if the reader were to, to stutter when he said God's name, or if the reader were to <coughs> cough while he's saying the name of God, well, whoa, we don't want to treat God's name in vain like that. 
And I'll tell you, as much as I, much as I can appreciate that, I can respect the lengths that a very discerning Jew would go so as to not even carelessly mispronounce or utter God's name in a profane way and to be very reverent about that. i got to tell you, it still fails to reckon with the fact that God gave His name. He gave it for a reason. You think about it, the name of God, it appears literally thousands of times in Scripture. And why is that? Because the God of heaven wants people to know Him. Since His name stands for who He is, God wants people to know Him so that they can then love Him and worship Him and serve Him and praise Him and proclaim Him. Knowing the name carries with it some responsibility. But when God gives His name away, there's a risk that it might be used wrong. And that then brings us to the second component of that command in Exodus 20 verse 7. What exactly does it mean to use the Lord's name in vain? Because that sounds like something that I would want to try to avoid, doesn't it you? Uh, The term vain here is a term that carries with it the idea of of waste or disorder. Maybe synonyms for the word vain here would be the word empty or frivolous. And I really need us to think and lock in right here this morning because if you think that this is simply and only about what it is that comes out of your mouth, the vibrations that come up through your vocal cords and make their way through your lips and come out into the air, if you think that's only what this is about, then I think you're really missing the heart of this command. Because this command is talking about more than just how we utter the divine name with our voices. It's talking about the attitude and the heart that is behind the voice that says those things. Exodus 20 verse 7 is warning about an attitude of disrespect for God that oftentimes demonstrates itself through the thoughtless or pointless or misleading or false use of God's name. i say that again for emphasis. This is talking about an attitude, an attitude of heart that demonstrates a thoughtless, pointless, misleading or false use of God's name as a sign of respect and reverence for God, God's people were to exercise great caution and great care in how they spoke of God and how they invoked His name on a regular basis. They were to do nothing that would be thoughtless, pointless, misleading, or falsely using His name, which would end up detracting and taking away from God's gloriousness and greatness and His character and all that He is. Now what would happen if somebody did that? Well, what happened if you disobeyed this and you did take God's name in vain? Well, what the Lord says finally in that command is He says, I'm not going to hold you guiltless about that. In other words, this is not an idle threat. Did you ever have the experience when you were younger? Or glad we've got the high schoolers and teenagers out here today. Young people, have you ever had to experience this from your parents? Where your parents, maybe one of them comes to you, you're in the middle of doing something that you know you shouldn't be doing. And your parents get that really strong, stern look on their face. Their eyes swell up to about the size of half dollars. And they say, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And I mean, they're not even blinking. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Those words mean something, don't they? And we take those words seriously. And that's what God's going for here. God's saying, you better take me seriously. Now, the punishment is actually not described here in Exodus 20 and in verse 7. But it's clear that God takes offense to anyone who would be involved in some kind of thoughtless, pointless, misleading, or false usage of His name. God sees that as a direct attack on Him. God takes that personally. And why? Because the name represents Him. It represents who He is. God says if you do that, then there's going to be problems between me and you. In fact, we actually have a record of that occurring. Did you know that? Look at Leviticus 24. Step out for just a second. In Leviticus 24, we have an example of what it seems like somebody using God's name in vain. And what exactly happened on that occasion in Leviticus chapter 24? I'm reading in verse 10. In Leviticus 24 and in verse 10, we're told that an Israelite woman's son, whose father was an Egyptian, he went out among the people of Israel. And the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel, they fought in the camp. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name and cursed 
Then they brought him to Moses. Drop down to verse 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, You bring out of the camp that one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And you then speak to the people of Israel saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native. When he blasphemes the name, he shall be put to death. Now again, I don't know all the specifics of what happened there on that day, but that guy obviously misused God's name. He used it in some kind of either pointless or thoughtless or misleading or false way, and he ended up paying for that with his life. He died. And I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen to people today. Like right on the spot, you're just going to get struck with lightning. But what I am saying is that God's not kidding around here. What Leviticus 24 is saying, what Exodus chapter 20 is saying, is that God expects to be taken seriously. And that should have been clear to Israel long ago. And that ought to be clear to us today. Just when you look at Exodus chapter 20 and you look at the placement of the commandment itself, did you notice there in Exodus chapter 20? Did you notice that this is not law number 457 buried way down deep somewhere in the Mosaic covenant between a couple of other laws about how to deal with your neighbor's oxen or something? Where is it? It's number three on God's top ten list. And that says to me that God wants to be taken serious. And I wonder if maybe the reason that this does appear as such a high priority of God's list of things that He wants His people to think about, I wonder if that's because God knows just how prone we oftentimes are to the false, misleading, pointless, and thoughtless use of His name. To use His name in a way that takes away from His character and His goodness. It's almost as if, I think God expects that people out in the world are going to treat His name frivolously. Sometimes God's people are guilty of that as well. How might that manifest itself? Let's put some teeth on this as we close this morning. What about that most common misuse of God's name? And that is that whenever God's name is used as a declaration of surprise, or maybe almost even as a declaration of disgust. You know, no discussion about the vain usage of God's name would be complete without including this one here on the list. But... I actually intend to be brief because I hope that you've already seen this morning that this is not the sum total of the command that was given. But there is an application here, isn't there? If Exodus 20 and verse 7 is condemning the thoughtless and frivolous and careless use of God's name, then this business of just kind of randomly going around at any point in life and just shouting out, oh my God this and oh my God that or Jesus Christ this and Jesus Christ that, that absolutely fits this bill, doesn't it? Young people, I'll say this to you. You've gotten very keen in how you're able to communicate in these days and times. And sometimes we've developed little acronyms for different things that spells things out. Maybe it's almost kind of code language to keep mom and dad kind of oblivious to stuff. Those letters OMG in a text message or on a social media post, those things absolutely fit this bill as well. I wonder, what does it say? about people today. When the Jews of old, they would not even say or even write the name of God, and yet people today use God's name as an exclamation point. Where is the consistency in that? That isn't right. That is never going to be right. And do I even need to say anything right here about attaching God's name or the name of Jesus to cursing and to profanity? That happens all the time. People are just going to kind of add God's name on top of other profane language so as to kind of strengthen their cursing. Kind of gives it some extra oomph in the things that they say. I'd even add to that. I don't have it on the screen here, but sometimes even the jokes that we tell. And I'm not even talking about like crude or, you know, immoral jokes. I'm just talking about the kind of jokes that we would almost kind of consider clean humor, but God is kind of the punchline, or God is maybe the subject in those jokes. I I think we need to tread very, very carefully there. God's name must not be used in those ways. And if you find either of the usage of God's name in your mouth or in your heart, more importantly, then what's the answer to that? You need to repent of that. You need to stop doing that today.
That's not taking the Lord seriously. And in the words of Jesus, that doesn't hallow His name. But I do hope you realize that's not the only way that we can fail to reverence God and His name. What about this? What about using God's name to do evil? That would also be a false or misleading use of God's name when we attach it to evil deeds. For example... There are some here in our country who are are, are very zealous and are very concerned about the scourge of abortion that has existed in the country for the last 50 years or so. And I'll just say, that is a legitimate concern. It is bothersome where we have come as a nation of people where we can just take innocent lives in that way. But there are some who who even profess to be Christians. And so in the name of God, in order to stop that abominable practice, they will go and murder abortion doctors. Or they will set up bombs and blow up abortion clinics in the name of God. No! No, no, no! A thousand times no! We cannot attach God's name to evil doing. Shall we do evil that good may come? Absolutely not. There's examples of that all around us. I think there's that, they're very famous. The, the Westboro Baptist Church out in Kansas. You've maybe seen them before. These are the folks who show up at, at like the funerals of soldiers and they show up with their big signs and they're picketing and they're causing a scene and a commotion and almost kind of gleeful that this person has died and their family is weeping and they're saying all these just really blasphemous things about God as if somehow God is on their side as they do all of this and... That too is a false usage of God's name. You know, you just watch throughout Scripture. God is very concerned about His reputation. That's probably one of those common themes all throughout the Bible, from the Old to the New Testament. God is very protective of the kind of things that His name gets connected to. And God does not want His name dragged through the mud by connecting Him in any way to the very evil that He hates and He loathes. God forbid that the name of Jehovah would ever be associated with anything like that. God's name must not be used as a license for evil. Fourthly, would you find Jeremiah 14? In Jeremiah the 14th chapter, the the prophet here speaks about a use of God's name that is wrong, and that is whenever God's name is associated with things that God has not said. In Jeremiah the 14th chapter, I'm reading here in verse 13, You remember that Jeremiah spent nearly 40 years preaching pretty much the same message every single day to the Israelites. Repent. Repent, 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 or judgment is coming. And so we're told in Jeremiah 14 and in verse 13, Jeremiah then speaks and he says, O Lord God, behold, the prophets are saying to the people, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. Jeremiah says, Lord, I'm out here preaching that message of repentance that you told me to preach. And I'm trying to warn people of the judgment that's going to befall them. And there are other prophets, false prophets, who are saying things that, oh, that's not going to happen. There's not going to be any sword, no famine, no pain and hardship. It's just going to be peace. It's going to be wonderful and it's going to be amazing. What's God's response to that? Verse 14, the Lord said to me, those prophets... They are prophesying lies in my name. They're prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, a worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. That is a false use of God's name. Because really, it just totally misrepresents the Lord and what the Lord is all about. Here's somebody who maybe has developed some idea of, all right, here's some message that I want to convey to the world. Here's something that I want to convince people of. Here's something that I want people to buy into and to be all about. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to present that message and I'm going to hang a thus saith the Lord on it and, well, that'll really get people's attention. That'll really cause folks to think and buy into what I'm selling. By the way, does that not precisely fit so many of the things that people say today like, like, you know, the, 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 Lord just, the Lord just laid this on my heart. And sometimes that's just code language for, I've got a friend who says this from time to time, God spoke to me. 
God just told me something. I was in my room the other night and I was praying and God just audibly spoke to me and said these things. There's lots of those television preachers who do that very thing. They stand up in front of audiences of people and they say, the Lord spoke to me and He revealed these things to me and I'm now sharing those things with you and revealing those things to you. What's going on in those cases? Folks are using God's name to prop up their own actions and their own agendas and they may even believe what they're saying. They may even believe it very, very sincerely. But since the Lord has not told them, they are misusing the name of God. And the truth of the matter is, I I could do that. I could do that with with the, the name of a powerful person. I could stand up here and I could say, by the name of King Nebuchadnezzar, I command you to go mow my lawn, boy. I hate mowing the lawn. I'm always eager to pass that off to somebody else. In the name of King Nebuchadnezzar, you get to doing that. I could do that. You know why I could do that? Because Nebuchadnezzar's not here. I don't have to take him serious. I could bark and shout orders. Hey, you in the back, in the name of King Nebuchadnezzar, go back there and get me a cup of water right now. I could do that. I don't have to take Nebuchadnezzar seriously. But God? Hmm. That's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? God is present. And God is real. And I do have to take Him seriously. And whenever I use His name to prop up things that He's not said, I have used His name in vain. Now, I would expect that whenever we cranked open Exodus 20 verse 7 a few moments ago, that nobody was surprised when I then put these various applications on the screen. In fact, I would hope that in a good audience like this on a Sunday morning, that most of us are kind of going down that list and thinking, okay, good there, I'm good there, I'm good there, I'm good with that. Hey, Josh, thanks for that info, I'm good to go. But I still got five minutes. And I still got space right here. And I'm one of those people that I'm really all about. I need to have symmetry with my PowerPoints, and so I want to make sure I maximize the space. Let me give you one more. This is the one that's going to punch you in the gut and stomp on your toes and slap you in the face. Isn't it true that if that third commandment is about the pointless, misleading, thoughtless, and false use of God's name that detracts from His character and who He is, then what happens whenever we offer our worship unto God and we even invoke God's name multiple times in our worship, and our heart is not in that. Would that not also constitute a vain and pointless use of the name of God? I came together and assembled with all the Christians on Sunday morning, and we sang that song, Our God, He is Alive. And then I walked right out of the building and I live my life as if He actually is not alive. We sang that other wonderful hymn, Here am I, Lord, send me. But I really didn't mean that. I really have no intention of being sent or going. I'm going to kind of pass that off to somebody else and that will be their responsibility. I bowed my head in prayer and I said those words, Our Father who art in heaven, but I didn't really mean it. I wasn't really thinking about that. I was just kind of chanting a phrase that I had heard so many times before. The supper was passed. And I broke me off a pinch of cracker. And I took me a swig of that grape juice. But I didn't think one thought about God's sacrifice. I didn't think one heartfelt thought about His Son and about what that meant. I didn't do any examination of the Lord and His will in my life. Can I ask you, Isn't all of that just a sham and a farce? I wonder sometimes if we're just so practiced, we're just so rehearsed at at going through the motions. We know when to when to stand up and when we sit down and when we bow our heads and okay, we do this and then that. We're just kind of we're just so used to all of that that somehow we've kind of in our minds thought that that well, nobody else can tell what's really going on inside. So much so that, well, maybe God Himself really can't tell. I mean, He saw me stand up. He saw me sit down. He saw me bow my head and do all that kind of stuff. But He really can't see what was going on inward. That when we sing of Him, that when we speak of Him, when we talk to Him, and in that moment we pretend as if, yes, this is what it's all about. Oh boy, I'm really into this right now. And yet deep in our heart of hearts, 
We have no intention of following through. We're not thinking about Him. We're not praising Him from the depths of our spirit. Do we imagine in some way that that does not constitute a vain use of God's name? Let me just ask you right now, how different is it for someone to just thoughtlessly say, oh my God, oh my God, but for you or I to come into this assembly and to thoughtlessly sing the song, Jesus, name above all names. Is it really any different? I would submit to you this morning that it is not. This command means that when we speak of God, when we use His name, when we fill our mouths with words about Him and about His things, brothers and sisters, we better mean that. Because vain talk and empty chatter with God's name woven and stitched all through it, that's wrong. That is wrong Anywhere. That's wrong in the workplace on Monday morning. That's wrong in the church building on Sunday morning. We must take God seriously because His name matters. Now I would hope that we are all challenged a little bit better by Exodus 20 and in verse 7. And by all of the various applications that flow from it, names, names have always mattered, haven't they? You chose your children's name very carefully. Your, your name, I believe, was probably chosen very carefully. And we expect that name to be handled very, very correctly. If somebody mispronounces our name, what are we usually quick to do? We say, hey, no, 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 hold on, no, no, no. It's pronounced McKibben. Not, not, not McGevin, not McGavin, McKibben. Enunciate a little bit. We're pretty quick to do that with those names. If somebody were to take our name and decide that they're going to kind of attach that to something that's not so great, Somebody maybe is out hammering on their shed and they happen to miss and ah, the hammer hits their thumb. And they decide in that moment, they shout out, oh, Randy Reader! Ah! Randy, you, you good with that? You good with your name kind of almost being used as a curse word? We'd straighten that out in a hurry, wouldn't we? Exodus 20 verse 7 tells us where we got that concern for our name. We learned it from our Father. Because God takes His name seriously. He expects His people, of all people, He expects His people to speak of Him in a way that shows careful thought, and deep focus, and an intention to honor Him in everything that we do, and yes, in everything that we say. God's name matters. Let's be people who are determined to hallow that name in every way and in all ways. Can we close in a word of prayer? I didn't close the first session in prayer, but I'd like to close this one with a brief prayer. Let's pray together, please. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, we come before you this morning to praise your name. We come before you today to lift you up and to exalt you for all that you are. Father, you are already exalted. We pray that today, through our actions, through our words, and through these activities of worship that we involve ourselves in, that you will be magnified and glorified in all things. Father, we come confessing that far too many times we treat your name in a frivolous manner. More importantly, Father, that reflects something that is amiss in our hearts. Father, we're begging for your forgiveness. Father, there's no excuse for it. We know exactly how you have felt about the use of your name and how people talk of you and speak of you all throughout generations. We pray, Father, that we would be people who would have reverence and that that would be manifested in how we live. We pray, Father, you would help us to be reverent, not just here when we're together, and maybe that's a little bit easier to do, but help us, Father, to be a reverent people when we leave one another's company and we're out in the midst of a world that, that doesn't care for you. Help us, Father, to be the ones who would be light and we would show them the way and show you how glorious and wonderful you really are. We thank you most of all for the gift of your son Jesus and all that was expressed through him the significance of your giving of Him to us. We pray that you'll be with us throughout this day and that you'll forgive us of where we fall short. It is in the name of our King Jesus that we pray.